Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today titled How to Be an Influential Kaizen Coach. I'm Mark Rabin, the VP of Customer Success for KaiNexus, and I'm going to be today's moderator and co-presenter. And really, my role today is uh, just to get things kicked off and hand things over the bulk of time uh, to my good friend and uh, co-author, Joe Schwartz. Joe and I are the co-authors of the books Healthcare Kaizen and the Executive Guide to Healthcare Kaizen, and Joe has uh, a wealth of experience that he is going to share with us today. So thank you very much for uh, being a part of this. So let me uh, spend just a few minutes introducing um, Joe Schwartz. Um, Joe, uh, again, you know, I've been uh, just you know, thrilled and honored to, uh, to work with him over the last uh, five years or so uh, on, on our books and, and trying to help spread Kaizen and continuous improvement. Uh, Joe has uh, been the Director of Business Transformation for the Franciscan St. Francis Health uh, System in Indianapolis. Um, he has a total of 20 years of uh, improvement experience where he's been leading continuous improvement efforts of different types, including about 10 years in healthcare. He's led more than 200 Lean and Six Sigma improvement projects. Joe is also the co-author of the book with his, with his dad, uh, a book titled Seeing David in the Stone, Finding and Seizing Great Opportunities. You can find that uh, on Amazon. Uh, he studied electrical engineering at Cleveland State University as well as management at Purdue University, where Joe graduated as a Cranert Scholar for Academic es Excellence in their master's program. So Joe had worked as a consultant in the first part of his career working in automotive engineering at General Motors, semiconductor manufacturing, uh, pharmaceuticals, aerospace assembly, uh, including some time at Honeywell, where Joe was trained as a Six Sigma black belt. So um, happy to have uh, Joe doing uh, the bulk of the presentation today. So just to tee things up, and a lot of this may be kind of a refresher course, or I'll just go through this very quickly to set the stage for what Joe is going to talk about in terms of effective Kaizen coaching. So the word Kaizen, of course, it's a Japanese word that has two parts. It basically just means good change. Uh, you know, a lot of people will use the, the word Kaizen to imply that they're doing a Kaizen event. We'll hear people, somebody reached out for the, uh, the webinar and said, you know, we're, we're going to do a Kaizen next week. And I'm pretty certain they meant, you know, kind of a structured team-based Kaizen event. And those are fine. Those are well and good. But Kaizen also means an approach to daily continuous improvement. We've all learned a lot from Masaki Amai, who you see pictured here. He's the founder of Kaizen Institute. He published uh, the first book in, in the West called Kaizen in 1986. And Mr. Amai emphasizes, as Toyota and other companies would, uh, you know, that Kaizen is about everybody improving everywhere in every day. So that doesn't mean every day we're doing a big Kaizen event, but we can be identifying and solving lots of little problems in the workplace. So this diagram um, is meant to illustrate what you might call three different levels of uh, Kaizen. Um, this is an illustration that um, you know, Joe and Franciscan have put together, illustrating the really large Kaizens, good changes, such as a new bed tower, an EMR system. Then there's that middle level, medium-sized Kaizen, of things like Six Sigma projects or A3s and lean events. But you know, Joe and I wrote our books and have done this work together to help emphasize the importance of also doing daily Kaizen or small Kaizen. So it's not a matter of which do you choose, but it's a matter of how these all uh, fit together. We have small problems. We can solve them with relatively small efforts and do lots and lots of those improvements. And then there's also larger things that we need to solve. And uh, the, these all go hand in hand. And so the Kaizen process, as you know, they, they developed at Franciscan, and as we wrote about in our books, you, you can think of it as having five steps. And again, focus really on daily continuous improvement, even though um, this, this could probably also apply to larger Kaizen, to help find problems and opportunities for improvement, and then to discuss them within a team or with the supervisor, then to, to implement or test the idea and you know, to see if it's really a good change. And so this may cycle back. We may try something and discuss it some more and try something again. But then we get to the point where we're happy with what we've done. We then document and help share the idea, help spread uh, continuous improvement. And, and I'm sure Joe is going to touch on that here today. 
So if we'd say, you know, in summary, what is a Kaizen? You know, ideally, there's some measurably better performance. Uh, we can't always measure, but sometimes we have to just sort of gauge or sense if it's better. Uh, but more often than not, we want to try to tie the improvements saying, did we reduce walking times? Uh, did we reduce infections? Is there something measurable involved to know if it's a good change? So we may look at things like safety, quality, time, cost, morale, and making sure we avoid suboptimization. A Kaizen is an idea that's been implemented. You know, we don't get credit for just brainstorming ideas. We need to go and put them into practice. And that's one thing they've been so good at at Franciscan. And even if an idea fails, we could consider it a Kaizen. We learn from it, we improve upon the idea, we try again, and we iterate. So people often ask, you know, how do we get started with Kaizen? We can learn about Kaizen, uh, we can try to teach people about Kaizen. How do we go and start? And, and I say only half jokingly, the way to start is to, to start, you know, that we, we can't put together you know, a perfect understanding of Kaizen. This is very much a learn by doing approach. We, we can't expect to be perfect before we start. At some point, you know, with a little bit of planning and a little education, we go and, and get started. And I think that's why coaching matters. And that's going to be Joe's main topic here. You know, there might be one approach to Kaizen or to lean uh, or other methodologies. You know, we take a class, we think about it, we plan, we read some more, we plan again. For those of you who know, who know the plan, do, study, adjust cycle, we, we want to avoid plan, 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 plan. We need to plan, do, study, adjust. So a lot of organizations get stuck thinking, well, we can't start until we think we'll do it perfectly. Or I hear people say, you know, we can't do Kaizen because we don't have a culture of continuous improvement. And I say, well, you know, you get that culture by taking this action. You, the, the, the culture doesn't magically develop. So we, we think approach number two is to you know, do a little you know, planning and then start doing Kaizen. Study and adjust as you go. And I, I think you know, this would be true in a lot of other situations. We can learn by doing, but that is most effective when we've got a coach or a mentor. You think if, if you're learning how to cook, if you're learning how to drive, if you're learning how to play golf, you, you can't just flail around and, and do. Sometimes you need an experienced coach uh, to, to help you out. And, and that's something Joe and, and his leaders and staff have done such a good job of. So as I hand things over to Joe, I just want to introduce, you know, Franciscan St. Francis Health System on their behalf. You know, it's a, a health system in Indianapolis. When they got started with Kaizen, uh, in a formal process in 2007, since then they've uh, implemented and documented more than 25,000 improvements they have roughly, they've reached a point of about 40% staff participation each year. And, and Joe may touch on that during his presentation about how they're trying to increase that participation in a good way through coaching. They've documented more than $6 million in, in hard cost savings validated uh, by, by finance. And on top of that, there's, there's sometimes sort of priceless benefits around patient and staff safety, quality, patient satisfaction, waiting times. Uh, things that are either harder to measure or harder to put into dollar terms. So I've always been incredibly impressed the couple times I've had it, uh, the chance to visit Franciscan, and, and that's why we're so happy to have Joe here to share more of that story. Um, so with that, um, Joe, if you'd like to say hi and introduce yourself, and we'll make sure hopefully this handoff is a smooth one uh, with, with the keyboard and everything. Go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Mark. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, We've uh, learned that Kaizen is really driven by our leadership, and they, the leaders that really do a really good job with this create an environment for Kaizen to flourish. And uh, one of the environments they focus on is the coaching environment, and that's what I talk to you about today. Okay, I'm going to talk about coaching for staff mostly. Mark's going to come back later on and talk a little bit about the nuances of coaching at the senior management level. Um, at Franciscan, we kind of came up with five fundamentals. And these aren't the do-all, say-all fundamentals, but they're really focused on supervisors who coach direct reports. So it's not really so much focused on coaching for a black belt or someone like that. This is really what we're teaching our supervisors on how to coach their direct reports through the implementation of Kaizen ideas. And that's kind of the context that we develop these through. 
And the first one that we really wanted to stress to our leaders, and I saw it in the leaders that excel in the departments that really do it well, is they focus on developing themselves and others through cycles of learning. Um, they iterate through um, these Kaizens, and, and they're making changes as they go and advancing. Like Mark says, they just start, and they figure it out themselves. And they start with this feeling that there is untapped potential in, in everyone, and that untapped potential is extraordinary. That's kind of a philosophy I see in these uh, leaders that do this well. And the Kaizen is really a means for them to uh, develop and grow people and their capabilities, uh, particularly capability to do improvement idea implementation. At uh, Disney, they have Imagineers. At Franciscan, we have our Kaizeneers, people who implement Kaizens on a regular basis. Um, here's a, a picture of a bulletin board. We had a bulletin board contest a number of years ago, and this bulletin board won the contest. And because they get it, they really understand what the purpose of Kaizen. Um, as you can see, ideas rain down from above. Um, nutrients are picked up through the roots of the flower, and the petals of the flower are the Kaizen. So that's the beautiful part of the flower. That's what people see is the uh, results, the benefits to everybody. But if you notice, the center part of the flower are people. And I think they really got it, that they realize the fruit of the flower, the part that's going to propagate this whole system and make it grow and spread is really in the center, it's the people. So this is really a system to develop people. If we don't develop the people, the um, system won't propagate and we won't have more beautiful flowers. Number two is demonstrate love and respect. I've, I've noticed when I've been in coaching sessions with some of these leaders that do a really, really good job, you walk away feeling like you were just loved on. I know a lot of us have a tendency of being very analytical, and we tend to pick, pick problems apart. Well, sometimes after one of our sessions, sometimes the people in the session feel like they've been picked apart. So um, the people that really do this well have a way of picking things apart, but leaving people feeling like they were very much loved and respected. Uh, John Wooden said it best, the famous basketball coach, they won't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So it's got to start with love and respect and care. Uh, the mo probably the most powerful way to show love and respect is to say yes to their ideas, to employee-driven ideas. We have a coaching benchmark of 90 per plus percent implementation rate. If you look at some of the statistics out there, about a third of the time, um, leaders say yes to an employee's idea. Uh, that's just not very good. If you implement a Kaizen program and you're at the 30-some percent yes rate, it's going to stagnate and perhaps die. It's going to be a miserable growth. To really get a high-performing Kaizen system, your leaders have to say yes 90% um, of the time. In our pharmacy department, we're currently at 89% yes rate. Um, it's really difficult to get to a 100% yes rate in the pharmacy because it's such a patient safety sensitive area. Um, but 89% of the time, you can imagine if if you were throwing out ideas and only a few percentage of them got accepted, you kind of the average employee gives up after a while, and just shuts down and clocks in and shows up and doesn't really contribute. But if they're getting yes nine times out of ten, they're more likely to keep throwing ideas out there, especially if we coach them on how to make those ideas successful, and they play an important role in <clears throat> putting those ideas in place, Kaizen programs are going to flourish. <clears throat> so that's probably one of the most important things I want to get across in this whole coaching thing is <clears throat> you have to figure out how to say yes, not maybe to the idea as it's presented. you got to dig down and figure out what is underlying that idea, that idea that really we can do something with, we can test something, something about that idea. There's something core or essential that we can pull out of that and test it and coach people on how to implement those kinds of things. If you can do that, then you're going to have a very successful program. Um, part of these sessions is to make sure you prepare the coachee. So be clear when you're talking to the person as a boss versus a coach. So if you walk up and say, we need to talk, um, you're likely to get a response that's not real favorable. They're going to be very defensive. But if you walk up and say, hey, I saw your Kaizen idea, and uh, I was wondering if you would like some coaching on that idea, <clears throat> you're more likely to get an open mind and a better dialogue. So start with permission to coach. And then <clears throat> put the coachee at ease by um, 
level, making sure they're comfortable, and uh, start where the learner is. And I got a little example starting where the learner is here. Uh, Peter, Peter's first Kaizen. Peter, I'd see him in the hallway, and uh, we'd joke around, and he liked jokes, so he'd stop and talk about his latest joke. And I asked him how he's doing with Kaizen. He said, I don't really have time for Kaizen. And I knew what he did have time for. He had time for telling the latest joke. So I said, well, I'll tell you what. Turn into Kaizen as a joke, and tell me when you do, and I'll talk to your manager and get it approved. And he turned in one, and this was his first one. And then he turned in another joke, and then pretty soon he started turning in real Kaizens. And it was a lesson for me. I, I was able to engage him in something he was passionate about, and that was having fun. So we got him engaged in the system with having fun, and, and then he started doing the, the real stuff. So he is to figure out what engages our employees and start there. Make it fun for them. And then some other key points are um, um, seek out and embrace problems. Uh, staff's real sensitive to how you um, deal with problems. If you um, get upset when they surface a problem, they're going to not surface problems. So you've got to make a, create a really careful environment for problems to surface. Uh, acknowledge the idea. They need lots of information. And then you can start digging into going back the layers and share back what you heard so you make sure you're interpreting what they say well. And then don't tell. Um, shift from being autocratic to asking questions. Be Socratic when you start coaching. Uh, stay open and receptive. Staff can pick up and they can sense when you've, you've gotten closed down and they won't um, keep dialoguing. They'll shut down too. So you gotta, no matter how crazy the idea is, you gotta stay open and receptive to it. And then help them self-discover. I got a nice example here. Um, with Maggie Reed, she's a supply coordinator. Um, there we go. In respiratory therapy, and um, one day she was proud of her area and showing me her area. And as I was down there, I started noticing the respiratory therapist and what they were there for. And I asked them a few questions. I said, um, "What are you here to get?" And they, uh, thanks, Mark. They. Uh, they explained they were here to get so-and-so, and after a while I started noticing a pattern. And I have no business messing with her area. I didn't have a charter to start working in this area. But I just started uh, noticing, and I asked Maggie, I said, um, could you do me a favor? I said, in the next week, could you ask a number of the respiratory therapists coming down if what they're here for? And I, I want you to categorize it. Is it either are they here for parts or are they here for systems like a vent or a CPAP or a BiPAP? And asked her if she could do that. She said, sure. So I came back a week later and asked her if she had been able to get to that. She said, yeah. She said it was very interesting. She said about 80% of the time they're here for these systems. And I said, really? And she said, yeah. And I said, so how does that influence how you organize your supplies? And she said, well, I'm thinking of organizing by system. Um, Maggie had organized everything based on her view of the world. Her view of the world was parts. And she organized them alphabetically by part um, type. So a therapist would have to come down and hunt and peck around for the different parts by alphabetically and put together a system. So what she did is created an area where all the vent stuff is in one area, all the EPAP, BiPAP stuff is one area, all the CPAP stuff is another area, and saved the respiratory therapists about half their time. So they were twice as efficient getting stuff down in their area. Kind of became their hero. And I think this just illustrates that staff really do want to see for themselves. They want you to help them self-discover. All I did with Maggie was I just helped her see her world from another perspective. I helped her see her world from her customer's perspective. Once she could see her world from that perspective, everything else changed for her. And she did all the rest of the work. So um, this is just a nice example of coaching by asking questions and helping people see possibilities. Number three is focus on process and that's not just the Kaizen process but it's also the process they're going to make improvements on. And the Kaizen process is really about before and after. It's um, um, putting the before right next to the after and then showing, showcasing hundreds of these to our staff so pretty soon they get the idea that there can be an after. So we have these current state processes and there can be future state processes and that can have an effect, a positive beneficial effect on staff and on our organization. So if we keep marketing this out as before and after, pretty soon they start thinking, oh, I've, I don't have to accept this process that I'm working in. There can be an after. 
and I can get coaching on help helping me see how to do that after. It's really about helping them learn how to do that and how, how to help them uh, make the right decision, do the right things, help them see greater possibilities, and then guiding them to success. So what we do with Kaizen is we keep the idea in the holder of the the person that came up with the idea, we keep it in their hands, and then we partner them with people to make help make it get done, and then we coach them on how to implement and create an implementation plan. And the last step of, of that process is to make it okay to fail. Um, make sure we think through how we're going to protect our patients and their family if we try something, uh, how we protect staff member, you know, try stuff, and then uh, make it okay to fail and make it a learning environment. If they fail. I'll give you an example here of a, of a failure. This was um, Paula Stanfield, our manager of our NICU unit. She had been, um, she started with Kaizen. She'd been doing it herself for about six months and was really having trouble getting staff engaged. Uh, she had implemented a Kaizen where she went from a manual paper towel dispenser to an automated one. And then after a number of days, the nurses started noticing that when the uh, automated one would go off, it'd make a noise. And the noise was disrupting the babies that were sitting close by in isolates. Uh, so they went to her and, and said, we need to go back to the manual paper towel dispenser. And she said, well, let's just give it a while to trial. And, and the nurses went to the engineering department and got someone to come out with a noise meter and measure it and went to Paul and said, listen, it's uh, 50 decibels each time it goes off. And Paul thought, oh, okay, let's go back to the manual dispenser. And uh, Paula thought that was a failure going back, but uh, within a few weeks, Kaizen started rolling in. The, her program in her department really started taking off. So she went back to staff and asked, you know, what's going on? Suddenly, you're doing Kaizen. What's changed? And they said, well, you showed us it was okay to fail, that if we fail, it's no big deal. We just go back. And so we're just trying stuff. So it was a big lesson for Paula that she needs to create a safe environment, for Kaizen to fail and to, to, for everybody to learn something and feel safe. Now, number four is start small. This is for, at least for beginners. Um, this needs to be really reiterated again and again and again. People need to start small, and they need to. And the coach should break down these big problems into small, bite-sized chunks, and then help staff see how they can pick away at them chunk by chunk really driving towards baby steps. Every iteration should be a success for staff. If staff has a success with one Kaizen, they're more willing to do the next Kaizen. If we can make them small enough so they can have nice successes and just keep building, and they can have success after success. After success. We start developing confidence, some creative confidence, and that grows and snowballs and it affects other staff around them. Once they see someone having lots of success, they're more willing to step in when they see their uh, neighbor nurse having successes. I have a little example here. This was a nice small one, but it was based off of years of doing small ones. This nurse had been doing Kaizen for about three years, and she had developed a reputation for having nice Kaizens, nice small ones that everybody could implement and, and like. So she surfaced this Kaizen, and she had developed relationships with like the print shop and other things, through doing other small Kaizens. And so she talked to print shop about this and about to her manager and a few other nurses and she called the print shop and said hey I got this idea the print shop guy says yeah just send me down a PowerPoint slide and she did he printed these up these are laminated and they can be flipped around front and back held up by velcro and they indicate when a patient can have uh, food by mouth and when they can't and it's color coded for yes red for no and the most powerful thing about this is the manager came to me she said Joe this would have taken uh, uh, three to six months, three years ago, when, when we just first started Kaizen. But she said this nurse implemented this in three days across all 30 rooms in our in our unit. So the most powerful thing about Kaizen is when you break it down into these small things, and staff gets really confident doing these small things, they start doing bigger things faster. And you can really accelerate the rate at which you learn and improve. You just kind of work. Um, and then when you do get these really crazy big ideas like building a parking garage, you can really start the dialogue by helping them think through why a parking garage and what's it going to do for this person and get down to where maybe it was really just to get in out of the rain. And maybe they can just test an umbrella or test a parking space up close for a week or try a few different things to see what works best for them. 
type of thing. So breaking it down into these really small things we can test and build upon and gain confidence. And then number five is follow up. You feel the skill is standard, and it is a skill. I'll explain a little bit more why. And then remember, the purpose of this is to develop people, and it's through these learn cycles of learning. So we got to focus on what did they learn. Make sure they understand when they've learned something, what they've learned. And then probably most one of the most powerful things in the Kaizen system is that it benefits staff. And you as the coach need to make sure that they do receive the benefits, that um, the difference is really made, and that it does benefit staff and patients and family and society in general. If they see the benefits to them tangibly, they'll be more likely to do more of it. And then if they start seeing more and more benefits, they're going to get start getting really excited, and the program is really going to take off. If they don't see any benefits, they're going to have a stagnating program. So you've got to make sure staff clearly sees how this benefits them, the patients and family and society in general. Um, continually, and then you'll really get them fired up and engaged and turned on. And then ensure that they, they know they did it, keep it in their hands, and then facilitate their growth through this process and make sure they know that they're worthwhile, they're contributing, and they're an innovator to this whole organization just by following up later on and explaining how what this did for everybody. Here's a nice example with my son. Um, we did, uh, he went for his driver's test, and I taught him how to parallel park used job instruction training and I, uh, I walked him through the process and I did it once for him and we walked through all the steps and then he did it once and he said, okay dad, I got it. I said, oh no, 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 no. Oh, wait a minute, you got to do this a dozen, a few dozen times to really get it. And I tried to start explaining the difference between knowledge and skill and parallel parking. So many dynamics are going on that it's, and situations are different each time. It's really, it's, it's a skill. And he humored me, and he said, okay, Dad, let me, I'll do it a few more times. He did it three more times, and he said, Dad, really, I, I really got it. I said, oh, okay. So uh, he ended up taking his driver's test and failed parallel parking. <laughs> and the trip home was uh, kind of awkward. It was real quiet. I just let him sit in it for uh, for a while. And then close to getting close to home, I, I asked him, I said, so what did you learn? <laughs> was one of those learning moments. He said, Dad, you were right. He said, I, I, I get it. It's a skill. So I think he learned something that day. And Kaizen's the same way. It's different every single time. It, you just can't do it with head knowledge. You've got to practice it. And even as a coach, you've got to practice coaching hundreds of times before you really get it. And staff need to understand that. They're not going to get it the first few times. It's going to take dozens and dozens of times before they really get how to, to do it because it's really difficult. Changing an organization is hugely difficult. And reputation, repetition is the key. Um, I had a manager come to me, a new manager, she said, um, this Kaizen thing, it's taken me about a day a week, it's really time consuming. <laughs> I said, is that, is she said, is that supposed to take that long? And I said, no, no, um, tell me how you're doing it. She said, well, they bring me the idea, I put it on my to-do list, and it just takes a long time to get these Kaizens done. I said, oh, I said, well, that's not really the intent of Kaizen, the intent is really about developing yourself and others through cycles of learning and really you want to keep the idea in the hands of the person that generated the idea and then you as a leader you coach them you don't do any of it zero bit of it you coach them to do it themselves and uh, what you'll find is they'll get more confident at doing these things pretty soon they'll take on a lot of the daily problem solving that goes on in your organization and you as a leader will have more time to focus on the future so I circled back with her about a month later, and I said, so how's Kaizen going? She said, wow, huge difference. She said, you were right. They're now doing it all, and they're engaged and excited, and they're empowered. She said, now it's only taking me about an hour a week to, to do the Kaizens because they're doing it all. I'm just coaching. And I said, that's, that's the way it should be done. So next I want to turn it over back over to Mark to uh, talk about coaching at the senior leadership level. Well, thanks, Joe. And you know, it's great that you um, you know <clears throat> emphasize how everybody can use coaching, whether it's staff or leaders. We had a couple people comment on Twitter that managers often need that coaching when they're new to Kaizen, and we need to give uh, they need to give us permission, I think, to coach them. And you know, I get the opportunity sometimes to coach senior leaders, and I think the same thing applies. Um, get trying to get permission 
to coach them. It's hard to push coaching on anybody, yet alone uh, on, on senior leaders, just because of uh, politics and everything that takes place in an organization. But you know, the role of senior leaders is really critical in terms of the tone that they set, um, the example that they set for the organization. You know, everything that they do to help create a culture of continuous improvement tends to sort of flow down through um, other leaders. And, and this is really important. So whether it's the managers, you know, as Joe mentioned, saying, well, you know, we don't have time to do Kaizen. And then you ask questions, you be a good coach, you try to help figure out why that is, and you, you can try to get through that problem. You know, there, there's similar opportunities to try to coach senior leaders. Um, you know, a lot of times people will talk about these different barriers to Kaizen. Um, lack of time, um, lack of budget, people aren't interested, different barriers that are thrown out there. And those barriers could be real or it could just be a, a perception. You know, if people will say, well, you know, my staff don't have any good ideas. Well, how, how do you really know until you go and, and test that idea? Maybe you should think positively and, and uh, more often than not, you find out that, yes, they do have ideas. You have to give them that chance. Now, if people aren't speaking up, you know, you need to identify, you know, what is that barrier? What's getting in the way of people speaking up? You know, let's apply problem solving and Kaizen thinking to the Kaizen process itself. If lack of time is a barrier, we don't want that to become just an excuse. We don't want people just making excuses in a laundry list of why they can't do Kaizen. We need to try to reorient people around solving those problems. Um, and, and not just giving up as soon as a barrier uh, is raised. So, you know, one of those barriers, um, and I think often a real fear in a lot of organizations, you know, we might write this out on, you know, kind of a, a typical Kaizen format. Um, we could similarly enter it into Kinexus software this way. You know, staff fear layoffs will result from Kaizen. That could become a barrier. Well, you know, people are afraid of layoffs, so let's not try. It could be, be an excuse or it can be a problem we solve. So for example, senior leaders often kind of get out in front of this and make some form of a pledge, no layoffs due to Kaizen. And then of course you have to mean it, you know, you have to follow through on that pledge. So you might make a statement like this as a senior leader and, and maybe people don't believe you. So now that barrier is a lack of trust. Well, we, we can't just fall back and say, well, the employees don't trust the leaders, so therefore we can't do Kaizen. We need to try to solve that problem. How do we build trust in an organization? How do we make sure there's a minimum level of trust in place before we move forward? So any of these barriers, real or perceived, we need to frame them as problems to solve. And there's some other senior leader habits that um, can be really helpful or some of these habits that can really get in the way of good Kaizen practice throughout an organization. So one of the things would be for senior leaders to, to model the behavior of, uh, you know, stop jumping to solutions. You know, as much as I can generalize, you know, I've seen, you know, generally senior leaders <laughs> tend to jump to solutions more than middle managers or frontline managers. And, and a lot of that has been sort of reinforced by the system over decades. You know, they got to where they are by being action oriented and jumping to solutions, having answers, instead of stepping back and asking a question like, well, wait a minute, do we really understand the problem? Now, I've seen some senior leaders make really good progress in this, in this regard, where you know, as, as an outside coach, sometimes you have to model for them and say, wait a minute, time out, kind of like Joe was describing in his coaching with managers. When people are throwing out ideas and solutions to, to call time out and ask, hey, you know, do we really understand the problem? And then you start to see the senior leader you're coaching do that themselves and be the one to ask their middle managers, wait a minute, do we really understand the problem? That cascades through the organization. Now, I think you know, a similar idea or a bad habit to break is the idea of blaming individuals. And instead of blaming a person, look at the system, look at processes, ask, how did this occur? Instead of asking who, who are we going to punish? That, that fear of punishment leads to people not speaking up, and that gets in the way of Kaizen. And I think a third habit to try to break you know, is to stop staying in the office, that when somebody jumps to a solution or brings up a problem and we're talking about the process, don't just talk about the process. Say, let's go to the Gemba. Let's go to 
the shop floor or the, the, the unit in the hospital. Let's go and see things firsthand and talk to people instead of just making assumptions. So the best way to better understand the problem is to not just look at the process, but do so with our own eyes and getting out of the office. That can be a really hard habit to break. Or I've seen there's very systemic barriers where senior leaders especially might have their offices in a separate building that's not even uh, attached to the hospital. That's a very physical, structural barrier sometimes to going to the Gemba. So that could either be an excuse or that's a problem to solve. I've seen some senior leaders kind of get themselves an auxiliary office in the main hospital, a place they can set down a bag, uh, kind of a temporary home away from their office. And hopefully over time, maybe the senior leader uses that auxiliary office more so than the main headquarters building. So different habits like this are uh, a way of leading by example and, and coaching uh, down through the organization based on how senior leaders are behaving. And I think another habit that really has to be uh, emphasized and modeled uh, from, from senior leaders is to, to think about rounding or gemba walks in, uh, in a new way, of not being the judge, you know, of not looking for fault, not looking to assign blame, not looking to write people up, but, but thinking about going and, and celebrating improvement. So instead of judging people for the problem, celebrate the fact that they spoke up and that they solved something through a Kaizen process. And, you know, a lot of times senior leaders, if they don't really err on the side of celebration and recognition, if they, they lose sight sometimes if they ask a question. So somebody has talked to them, presented a Kaizen that they implemented, a senior leader might ask an honest question. They might ask, well, did you, why didn't you implement why did, did you also consider such and such idea? And that might be an honest question. It might be a question of inquiry. To the person on the receiving end of that question, that might sound like a huge criticism, not because of the way it was asked, but because of who was asking. So this is one area where I think senior leaders need to be really careful. And it can be helpful for them to have a coach sort of shadowing them and then pointing out in uh, you know, kind of a private moment, you know, the wait a minute, I think the way you're asking questions is maybe intimidating people and to, to try to adjust that behavior. So whether it's you know staff or managers or, or senior leaders, just to emphasize again, you know, the best way to start Kaizen is sooner than later, go and start. Take action, work on the things that you need to have in place to have a culture of continuous improvement. Identify barriers help solve problems. And, and when you start, here's just kind of a final thought. Often you know, that the, the hesitance to go and start comes from fear and anxiety, even among senior leaders. Managers, middle managers, senior leaders might say, well, you know, what if I mess up? They might be afraid they're going to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing. So you know, if we're modeling the right Kaizen behaviors, and we make a mistake. We ask a judgmental question or we criticize or we, we reject an idea before really understanding the problem. To, to embrace that Kaizen spirit that mistakes are really just learning opportunities. Admit mistakes. Own up to it. Be open and transparent. Point out our own mistakes. That will help others feel more comfortable um, admitting mistakes that they've made so that we can get better. To be humble and to be honest um, to ask for help and coaching, that's often a very new behavior uh, for senior leaders who have risen through the ranks, often in very self-sufficient uh, ways. And if there's a misstep, just keep going. Move forward, get better, um, Kaizen the way you do Kaizen and continuous improvement. So with that, let's um, invite everyone to uh, submit more questions. We have about 20 minutes here for Q&A, so that's, that's really uh, that's going to be awesome. Um, if you want to check out while you're submitting questions, take a look at uh, some of our past webinars uh, that we've done um, uh, with, with guests from different organizations or with myself or with our CEO, Dr. Greg Jacobson. You can go to kinexus.com slash webinars. Uh, if we don't do enough webinars for you, you can go to our blog. There's almost always something new on our blog every day, uh, blog.kinexus.com. You can subscribe uh, for email updates if you want to be notified uh, when we've got new stuff published. In our next webinar, we're going to present on uh, April, or I'm sorry, April, ugh, August 18th, 
uh, August 18th, uh, a Tuesday uh, at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern. It's titled Making Time for Continuous Improvement. So building upon that idea of people saying and asking us all the time, we don't have time for improvement. So what are some of the strategies and, and things that we can do to solve that problem instead of letting that be an excuse? So that'll be the next webinar. We'll send uh, an invite to you. We'll, we'll put a link to that when we send out the slides to this webinar or within a day or two, if you go to kinexus.com slash webinars, you should be able to find uh, the sign up for that. And uh, as we transition into uh, Q&A, thanks to those of you who uh, were tweeting along the way. Uh, if you want to contact us, uh, here's our email addresses. Uh, I'm still coaching. Joe, you're, you're using Twitter a little bit more, right? Y yes. <laughs> Joe is coming up to speed on, uh, on Twitter, so um, you could always reach out to him or uh, via email. So uh, in terms of Q&A, uh, Joe, I want to ask you a question first. Uh, the, the story, I, I've heard you tell the story about your son and, and learning how to drive. And one, one thing that makes me think of is, you know, as a coach, there's times where we think the person we're coaching might be about ready to fail. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, in your experience, when, how, how do you evaluate, you know, do you let the person try and fail, learn by doing, and, and when do you step in to try to um, prevent the failure? Can you, can you think of workplace scenarios or some of the thought process you go through and try to think when do you step in versus when do you let people move forward? Um, obviously, if it's going to hurt someone else, <laughs> you wouldn't want to let that go forward. Yeah. Um, I, I guess if I thought my son would have gotten hurt, um, I, I would have, you know, insisted and um, had a big intervention, of course. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, I thought, well, maybe he really does have it. And, um, I, I, you know, I thought at least he'd be safe with it. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the workplace, I, th I think sometimes leaders are kind of overly concerned or they're fearful. What if my people start implementing crazy things that harm somebody? And I, I found, look, I mean, you know, people in healthcare are, are generally pretty reasonable and, and not irresponsible. And, you know, when you build in that step in the Kaizen process of, you know, finding ideas and then discussing them, I think that creates enough of a check and balance without being bureaucratic. I agree. That was a big pushback from our leadership when we first introduced Kaizen. Is a few of the leaders thought it, you know, be mass chaos, you know, letting employees do anything they want, and uh, that really didn't happen, um, you know, because they have to work with um, supervisors as who act as the coach, and they have to work with other people in their area to get some of these things done. There were very few that were, um, you know, purely selfish and. Um, getting better, also better the organization as a whole. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think the leader is responsible for um, make help in doing all they can to make sure it's a success and make sure and it, it's safe and doesn't harm anybody. Um, but at some point, staff have to go through a failure um, because they're, they think they know it all. Mm. Uh, you have to kind of make it safe for them set them up for success, push them out there, but um, realize they may not quite do this right, but um, be there, ready and willing to coach if they're, like I didn't tell Paul, I just waited for him to be receptive. And it seemed like as we were approaching home, he seemed kind of like he was willing to listen at that point. So I just started asking questions like, um, so what'd you learn? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's good techniques for um, coaching, but I think they're, very willing to learn after a failure. They're, you know, failure is a very emotional event. So we often learn things better when it's infused with emotion. So they're going to learn it deeper and a lot longer if it's um, it's a, a failure that's somewhat emotional. Yeah. So it, okay. Well, so, um, we've got a couple of questions here from uh, Louise, who is actually joining us uh, from Brazil. So that's very that's very cool to see. Um, he was asking, in regards to the three levels of Kaizen, Joe, how many uh, ideas generally become a Six Sigma project or a larger lean project? How would you, how would you estimate those proportions? Uh, um, some ideas, but um, 
most of the big projects tend to be driven by leadership as a, it's a problem area, you know, um, not just uh, one or two problems, but the whole area is riddled with problems and uh, they get surfaced regularly and that's the kind of things that turn into big, bigger projects. Um, more and more we're trying to push ideas to be done sort of in a Kaizen approach, um, smaller scale, try a few small things first before we start renovating the whole um, hospital type thing. Yeah. So do you um, do you work with people? One thing I've seen that helps is to help people break down a big problem into something smaller. So people come forward with a Kaizen idea that says uh, something like, you know, patient satisfaction is really terrible. Well, that, that's a really big problem to solve. So you can you can do a couple of big projects to try to help with that. Or you can ask people, from what I've seen, to break it down into the different ways in which patients are dissatisfied and kind of you know, creating a, a smaller uh, subcomponent part of that problem that can be solved more easily as long as we're not, um, you know, I think that we, we need to make sure we're not sub-optimizing. But I find breaking those big problems down in the, into a number of smaller problems can be a helpful strategy. Do, do you have thoughts? on that? I, I agree. And then helping staff understand how to prioritize those to figure out which to do first, which is the high leverage, you know, and low resource cost one to do first, and then what do we do next? And helping staff think that through so that next time they know how to better know how to break down those problems into bite-sized things and know how to prioritize those bite-sized things. So over time they can do more and more of this on their own at the front line. Yeah. Uh, here, here's a question from James. It says, uh, did I understand correctly that a Kaizen is not a specific event, but more a process of making change? So let, let me touch on that. And then, Joe, I want to hear your thoughts and how you view this. So, yes, if, if, if you joined late, you know, we tried to uh, introduce early on that, that Kaizen is not just a formal two-day or three-day or four-day, you know, team event. Um, that events, rapid improvement events or whatever you call them, are a form of Kaizen. But Kaizen can really be any small change. So um, you know, I think a lot of organizations that are that do the best job of improvement, they combine all of these different models. Um, they're doing projects, but they're also engaging people to identify and solve smaller problems in the workplace every single day. Um, Joe, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of the history of where you had gotten started and, and how you incorporated daily continuous improvement or Kaizen into your uh, improvement model? Sure. We started out with the big Six Sigma projects, and they would take nine months to a year to do. And, um, you know, you could gauge maybe 15 or 20 people. Um, so after doing that for a while, you know, after a year, you can engage 100 people in how to think about problem solving and big projects. But we have 4,000 employees at our facilities in Indianapolis. So I'm I needed a way of engaging all 4,000 employees, and it wasn't going to be through Six Sigma projects. That would have taken 25 years if I was doing 10 projects a year. So I needed something, and um, I had seen something like this implemented in a company in Chicago where they engaged everybody in the organization in continuous improvement. It was it was a little different than Kaizen, but I gravitated towards Kaizen because it was very simple and easy to do and easy to use um, approach. And so we do it all now. We do the big Six Sigma projects. We do the frontline engaged Kaizen stuff. And we do the rapid improvement events and the medium-sized lean projects. And we do the really big innovative kind of stuff. So we're starting to get good at it all. And I think if you want to improve at a solid uh, rate, you need to do all those things very well. Yeah, and, you know, I've heard John Toussaint Dr. Jusant, who was, of course, you know, he was CEO at ThetaCare, and he's the head of the ThetaCare Center for Healthcare Value. Very similar reflections that they started at ThetaCare with the, the week-long rapid improvement events, and, and they did similar math of, you know, how long it was going to take to get everyone exposed um, to, to these approaches. So, um, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, kind of similar history out there. Um, Joe, here's a question from Allison. It says, in regard to your slide on implementing a 90% yes rate, do you have any suggestions on how to handle it when budget and financial restrictions are the barrier to saying yes? Um, we've kind of found that that doesn't happen as often as you, as you think. 
most of these can impl be implemented at no cost or very little cost, under $100. Um, and usually there's, uh, you know, ways to get the hundred dollars. I, I, uh, if the department doesn't have it, um, our department has kind of a bit of a slush fund, and uh, our nursing um, um, department in general, the CNO has a slush fund that we she can help with. We we find a way of doing it, and like um, Mark was saying, we break problems down into small bite-sized things. So instead of um, adding a shelf in every room across the hospital we pilot it in one room and study it and then uh, you know using cobbled together materials and then if that works out very well then we you know do an ROI analysis to figure out how to spread that to every um, you know patient bathroom in the hospital in, in, the, in the unit <laughs> next and then we trial it in that unit for a while uh, before we start spreading it to other units we'd have to cost justify as we go um, so it can be done very rationally and simply, but uh, in Lean we have a thing called creativity before capital. We try to figure out how to do, how to test things with very little cost up front. But yeah, there are some things that do require capital and an investment. Um, if you're going to um, remodel rooms, uh, if you're going to buy equipment, it's, it's going to cost money, but that's when it kind of jumps a little bit out of the Kaizen realm and becomes a bit of a, a study, an ROI study kind of thing. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a balance to be struck. Um, you know, there's there's a uh, kind of common lean expression saying, you know, put creativity before capital. And, you know, Kaizen or, or lean, it can't be a blank check to give everybody whatever they need because people early on especially will just come up with ideas uh, for spending money that might not be the best solution to a problem. So sometimes you have to push back and challenge people to be creative. There's also a time, though, I've seen examples where, let's say, in a primary care office, um, you know, there were 10 exam rooms and someone pointed out, you know, we've only got one digital thermometer and that creates a lot of wasted motion, a lot of waiting time. You know, once management learned about that, part of their reaction was, well, wait a minute, Why did we didn't know that. Why didn't anyone ever speak up? I'm like, well, that's part of the cultural problem sometimes where you know, people tried to speak up and they weren't listened to, so they stopped. Um, but management said, well, that's a, you know, that's a quote unquote no-brainer. Go buy nine more thermometers. So you know, giving people the tools they need, the basic tools they need to do their job, yeah, you might go be you know, very receptive and go spend the money. Um, other times, you're right, you have to be cautious and do maybe a small test of change. That's, I think, an important strategy. We had a Kinexus customer where you know, a tech in a unit said, well, we, let, the problem is you know, uh, patients um, lose their remote control and their glasses and their phone, and let's buy a little holder that we can put on the rail of the bed. So traditional thinking might say, well, you know, we have 300 beds. Let's go buy 300 holders. And you know, in the Kaizen process, as we were coaching through it, we said, you know, what's the smallest test of change that we could do? And we eventually worked our way down to saying, let's go buy one. Let's go test it. Let's see if it really works. Let's see if the patients like it. You know, that way, if, if, if you buy one that's a quote unquote mistake, you, you've made an inexpensive mistake rather than a big expensive mistake, right? So um, let's see. Uh, Joe, here's another question. Um, in general about Franciscan, is there a recognition program for uh, successful Kaizens uh, based on the amount of savings? We have a recognition program. Uh, um, a lot of the literature says that um, recognizing for the value of the Kaizen is not very effective. It gets into a lot of uh, dysfunctional kind of stuff. So what we do is we, we recognize them for going through the process, for, for them documenting and getting a Kaizen approved. They get um, 200 VIP points, which is a, a, just a small sum of money that they can use to go buy merchandise online at this uh, special site. Uh, so it's, it's just a small token of appreciation for them doing the process, no matter how small or how big. So if, if the idea is really simple and it, it's like moving a pencil to another location on a desk versus a Kaizen that saved $100,000, they would both we would reward our employees the same for both. Um, that way it's, it's fair and equitable. 
Um, there's, um, when you start rewarding staff for the value, then they start um, disputing who came up with the idea, um, who implemented it, who contributed, and who's going to share in the savings, and it just it, it goes places you don't really want to go. Yeah. So, it, it gets really dysfunctional. Like in a way, it sounds reasonable. Ah, I give people a percentage of cost savings, but those systems almost always break down into chaos, and they and they get discouraging instead of being, you know, incentivizing or or incur encouraging. That that's a common lesson with uh, suggestion box systems. The, the most effective recognition system is just appreciating them. And we do that through bulletin boards, through uh, sending out emails of notable Kaizens to all staff with, you know, whoever did it, its name on the Kaizen. Um, having star charts where we recognize how many Kaizens a person has turned in. We have badge holders that list how many Kaizen someone's done. So we have badge holders. Um, one gal has a 300 um, Kaizen badge badge holder type of thing. Uh, she's done over 300 of them. Uh, we have various ways of recognizing them without um, spending a lot of money. It's mostly just that we appreciate what they're doing. Yeah, and people talk about rewards and recognition. I, I like to say it in the, in the reverse, talk about recognition and rewards. Um, that a thank you, a handshake, a smile, helping people, as you said earlier, help people see the value of their Kaizen, helps them feel pride and, and excited about what they've done, and they'll go and do more. The power, especially in healthcare, um, intrinsic motivation is very, very powerful. I think that's powerful in other industries, but especially so uh, in healthcare. So, um, Joe, there, there's more questions that we're not going to be able to get to, and I apologize uh, to, to people for that. But Joe and I will we'll spend some time. We'll, we'll decide. We'll probably either do a podcast or maybe type up some answers and, uh, and share those. Um, Joe, do you have any, any kind of final thought um, that, that you wanted to share with people uh, before we wrap up here? I just want to thank them for their time and attention. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you, Joe. Thank you for your time uh, and sharing your experiences. I, I appreciate that you and uh, the team at Franciscan are um, uh, so so caring um, in, in how they share with others and um, try to help encourage others how to get better, you know, encourage others and, and show them how to get better. That's very powerful and uh, it's something you, know, you all don't have to do. So uh, it's very appreciated that you share your stories and, um, and that you need to do that. So, uh, Joe, on, on behalf of your whole team, please pass along um, you know, our, our thanks to them on, on behalf of the Kinexus team. Well, thank you, Mark. So, you. yeah, so we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap things up. But thank you for attending. Again, we will send out slides and a recording um, in, in the future. Please do join us again on August 18th uh, for our next webinar on Making Time for continuous improvement. Uh, on behalf of the team here at Kinexus, this is Mark Rabin uh, thanking you again and signing off.